that if you go to Europe, if you go to Asia, if you go to, go to Africa, everyone is looking at American universities and saying, that's the gold standard. That's what we want to be. You know, the, the Times of London publishes an annual ranking of world universities, mainly research universities, but they, but they rank um, maybe a thousand universities around the world. And, and in the top 100, it's called the THE 100, 60% of those universities are American universities. So what do we have to worry about? We have 60% of the top 100 universities in the, in the world. The catch is that those 100 universities enroll one half of 1% of all college students in the world. The 60 universities in the THE 100 enroll, generously speaking, 8% of American college students. So what about the other 90% who aren't going to Georgia Tech or Stanford or UGA or Duke? What happens to them? And that's, that's when the discussion gets difficult. That's when the discussion gets, um, uh, gets pretty, pretty interesting. So let's take a place like Georgia Tech. Uh, Georgia Tech has on campus about 20,000 20, students. If you count generously, we have an alumni base of another 120,000 living alumni, so 140,000 people that we touch in some way or another. This past October 1st, Georgia Tech's enrollment in massive open online courses past the 500,000 student mark. That's five times the number of people that we reach compared to what the bricks and mortar institution reach. Now, and we're gonna come back to this point, you have to ask yourself, so what, what does that mean? Those aren't all students, those are people that have just managed to enroll uh, in a website. But the fact of the matter is that among those 500,000 students are literally hundreds of thousands of people that knew nothing about Georgia Tech before they enrolled in the massive open online, online courses. And then you heard about the massive open online course approach to a low cost master's program where we promised not only a $7,000 master's degree, we promised the same quality as a bricks and mortar master's degree at a place like, like Georgia Tech. This little story that I'm telling is going on a hundred times around the country. There's change taking place in higher education at a rate that is really unimaginable. I, I, I've been through technology changes in my, in my career and the rate of change the pace of change in higher education is absolutely terrifying. So what's driving this? What's, what's driving this, this accelerated pace of, of, of change? Uh, there's a few things. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back and, and talk about some of these in a little more, um, little more detail. Some of them I think you know. Some of them you probably don't know. Um, so cost and performance I think is one that when we open up the paper we're used to seeing Tuition's going up, completion rates going down, what's with that? Um, that has driven a whole conversation about why are tuition costs going up the way that they are? Why is it that universities and colleges, particularly public universities and colleges, can't seem to graduate students in four, five, six years? International competition is is a big piece um, of, of this. As I said, we're a big target for, for Asia. We're a big target for, um, for places in the world that really want to emulate the success of American universities. And then I hate to say it, there's been a lot loss of, of public confidence in colleges and universities. Pew Research does an annual poll, kind of a, a pulse beat of, of 
how do people feel about colleges and universities? How do insiders feel? How do outsiders feel? And for the first time last year, the majority of the people surveyed by Pew didn't feel that a college degree was worth the price of tuition. 55%. There's no one that I know of who looks at higher education in this country that thinks that it's on a sustainable path. And let's just get real basic about this. Most universities, public, private, discount their prices so far below cost that they'll never make it up. And you can't sustain yourself very long. Now, granted, there are islands of excellence. You know, in, in the, the, the sea of 4,000 colleges and universities in the US, there's, there's a few, relatively few, maybe 200, that manage year after year to be financially sustainable, sustainable from a performance um, standpoint. But the vast bulk don't. And so the question is, how do you take these islands of excellence in this sea of problems and turn it into a system that performs well? You have to have a game changer. You have to do something, do something differently. And of course, there are many ideas about how to do that. I mean, people have been talking about computerized instruction for a long time, distance learning, uh, putting more or less people in classrooms, using using lower skilled um, lower skilled labor, part time teachers. Uh, in the, none of that has seemed to seemed to help very much. And the reason is the reason is that none of those approaches ever got to the heart of the problem in higher education, which is learning. So I'm drilling down to where the idea of MOOCs came from and what they're used for. None of this matters. None of what I'm saying matters if people walk into a classroom and they don't learn anything. They can graduate and not find jobs. They can enroll in college and not, and not graduate. They can find themselves in positions that, that the degree would say that they're not, that they're not, not suited for. Well, so th this has been a problem for a long time. How do, you, how, do you, how do you address the increased cost of education, lower performance in the classroom without automation? You have to be able to automate somehow. These innovations that you're seeing in the online master's degree at Georgia Tech and in MOOCs in general have a serious purpose. And the serious purpose is to increase the productivity, not of individual teachers, but of the educational enterprise in general. They take away the you can'ts. The thing that stopped American higher education, higher education around the world, from turning islands of excellence into a system of excellence is the you can'ts. You can't offer personalized instruction because you can't afford it. You can't offer personalized testing because you can't afford it. You can't provide federal support for students that need federal aid that is guaranteed to improve their educational experience because you can't afford it. The technology removes the you can'ts. And that's turned out to be a very, very big deal. I think increasingly the you can'ts are being erased by technology. The really great thing about what's happened in the University System of Georgia, what's happening at Georgia Tech, what's happening in the partner institutions that we talk to around the country is that the institutions that have the most to lose are the ones who've taken the bull by the horn here and said, we want to improve teaching, we want to improve pedagogy. Stanford University has gone on a hiring campaign for educational specialists. Why? Because they think that education can be improved not only for Stanford, but for the country as a whole. Georgia Tech has created my organization, the Center for 21st Century universities to be able to experiment with higher education, to be able to make mistakes, to be able to find out what's going to work in the future, and then translate that into practice, practice very quickly. And, and I, I will tell you that the whole system is designed 
to, to take care of 18 to 24 year olds. So, so, so we, we've built up a system of higher education that, that is aimed at taking, taking kids before they enter mom or dad's business and parking them for four years so they can, they, can, they can learn something. And the way that we talk about universities is filled with this kind of uh, imagery. Student experience, residential, residential students. In some cases, still, you know, the parental view of, of what, what the university is, is for. And boy, the world has moved so far beyond that. 18 to 24 year olds are no longer the predominant source of college students. It's what we used to think of as non-traditional students. These are returning servicemen, new arrivals to the US, people, late, later life learners who are coming back for a second or third career that need to be, uh, that need to be re-educated. Um, re um, and, and the policy has not, has not kept up with that. I, I heard, I, I've been on, a, been on a, um, a, a trip gathering information for the, for, the, for the new book and I'm just kind of filing away crazy ideas that I laughed off you know, one night and then woke up in the middle of the night and said, well, maybe, maybe that's not such a crazy, crazy idea. If, if, if we really want 18 to 24 year olds to have a good college experience, why in the world are we relying on universities to do that? We should be subcontracting that out to Disney. <laughs> Who knows more about creating an, an experience? Um, and and I, I, I heard that idea and thought it was, and thought it was, it was a joke, but, there, but there's an element of, of rational thought here. Um, maybe we should be not operating dormitories. Maybe we should be figuring out what part of the student experience really should be done by a third party who knows what they're doing and priced, and, and, and priced accordingly. Um, one of the reasons that we got to a six thousand dollar, seven thousand um, dollar price tag for the for the online master's program was we were able to filter out costs that had nothing to do with what a terminal master's student wants. Someone who's coming to Georgia Tech for a master's degree really doesn't care about the athletic fee. So that goes. You know, they really aren't going to live in a dormitory. So all the costs associated with that, with that go. And every one of those discussions was a very tough discussion both within Georgia Tech and you know, within the university system. But we got to this $6,000, $7,000 degree by saying, so what is really our cost in getting that student a Georgia Tech quality quality degree? Well, it's something south of $7,000. Productivity increases, what we thought the market would, would bear, what we thought we needed by way of new faculty, and $7,000 is a comfortable, for 10,000 students, is a comfortable, is a comfortable price point. Uh, that needs to be thought out on a large scale by many hundreds of institutions. Ladies and gentlemen, let's offer a warm thank you to Rich DeMillo. Thank you.